It is a Mark Anthony Jarman, the award-winning Canadian fiction writer, um, a graduate of Iowa Writers Workshop, and um, currently, I hope the information is up to date, a member of the English Department of the University of New Brunswick. Yes. Um, an author of a number of books, among others, the novel A Salvage Kingia, the short story collection uh, Knife Party at the Hotel Europa, which you can see here, the travel book um, Ireland's Eye, and many others. And as we usually, as we usually do at Odrieci Dorieci, we will begin with a short reading, a reading segment. Uh, or not so short, it is up to our guest to decide and, 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 and see. Um, from, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we, we will first read from Mark's uh, short story collection, Knife Party at the Hotel Europe. Mark, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. If I see a microphone, I have to play harmonica for a little bit. So. <laughs> this is a, it's a minor key, beautiful harmonica. I love it. By the way, I'm still in shock about the election in the States. So <laughs> I almost feel like I shouldn't read. We just talk politics. <laughs> It's actually the, the title story, and it's the scene with the knifing. Um, and I haven't, haven't really tried reading this before, um, but I thought it might be good. And it's, uh, it's supposed to be set in, in Napoli, in Naples, but it actually happened in Canada, but I was writing a book set in Italy, and Napoli always gets the blame for being violent, so I just thought, oh, I'll just move it, move it there. In the kitchen, they shove each other. Naples' surly suburban dancers pushing and fighting. Two sides, three sides, one room of the party becoming a minor brawl. A young woman says something is knocked over and kicked by the older neighbor, and she crawls the floor like a shouting crocodile. Maybe this is normal. The word normative pops into my head from Sociology 100. Hi, Professor G. I can't tell as there's so much noise in Italy, so much life, so many scooter horns beeping threats and throats calling out the dolce vita, vim and vengeance. During the day they shout at me at the grocery cashier, at the cafe, in the street, from the kitchen. It's a hectoring country, it's almost comic to be shouted at so much. Someone shouts, give them a lesson, leg for a leg. Which leg do they mean, Mr. Italy's leg, staple gun guys, the neighbor's leg? I want to stand up, but the stone woman laughs and pulls me down into her lap in smoky smell. She says her name is Maria, and she's friendly and warm. She's Italian. From this odd perspective, I have a sideways view of the crowded kitchen. Santino bends low, his face looking sleepy as he swings his arm in a resigned arc that ends with a knife driven into the neighbor's thigh. Blood gushes immediately at the base of the knife, as if Santino struck an oil well. And in the room, a general hiss of understanding and pity and then more voices, more shouting, more gesturing. His leg, his blood-splattered denim, blood falls from him, blood on the floor. I stand up too fast and feel pressure in my brow. My brain is collapsing, back to the baboon, back to the apes. Maria props me up as Santino runs out of the crowd like a hunched assassin. Mr. Italy and the others follow him out the door in a more assured manner. Staple gun guy looks at his liquid leg. The knife is gone from his leg. Who removed the knife? Maybe the assailant thought a jab to the leg was not dangerous, but how the blood wells, how it pours from the man, blood born in the kitchen, and he can't stop the blood freed from tiny culverts and tunnels. The neighbor's blood is dark, but glistens. Blood polka dots around the kitchen, dots the size of coins, red coins painting the canvas so quickly. 
Maria the Stone Woman stares at Staple Gun Guy. It's like opera. How can there be so much blood draining from one cut? The eye can't understand the image it seizes. I smote him thus. The neighbor looks down at his leg, nature staring back. No more chronic for you, no more nose candy. A young woman holds a tea towel to the gushing leg. It won't stop, she cries. The knife must have met an artery, severed an artery. We meet in a rented room of blood, blood so scarlet on their white floor and dark rug, and a trail as he heads to the door to another country. Don't move, they say, but the neighbor wishes to go home with his staple gun. It's my party and I'll die if I want to. You certainly do have a sense for cliffhangers, as you know, you guys, you guys. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting. You, 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 you actually you began um, with, uh, you know, with mention of the U.S. elections and how it shocked you and how we should talk politics. But you know, it's it, it, it's rumored that um, Canada is about to have a population boost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they said the, the immigration page crashed overnight. So many Americans were looking to see about moving to Canada. Yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, actually, I thought it was it was a satirical website, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems it yeah it seems it was real. Uh, speaking of which, you know, as opposed to my usual guests here at at at, uh, at this in this particular program. Um, who come from the region, from either Croatia or the neighboring countries, the region, you know, writing in small languages, publishing um, in these small literary fields. Um, actually, you're my first guest here who is an English speaking author and uh, an author from a big um, language and country. On the, on the other hand, you're from Canada, which sort is often overlooked in the in, in the English language literature yeah, yeah so and and but you are you are an acclaimed writer outside of Canada too uh, for example uh, your short stories won you the O. Henry award which is awarded for North America if I'm not mistaken yeah. uh, in general so you know in such a big language such a big literary field how does an author even come to be known or acclaimed or what does it even mean to be you know a, an accomplished author yeah I don't know if I'm there yet um, I guess you're always kind of hoping but as you say Canada is invisible in some ways um, I mean it's, it's you know it's got a great culture and I grew up watching the culture kind of grow and um, get more confident but we're so close to the states I mean it's it's like they say it's like sleeping in bed with an elephant you know and Hollywood and Wall Street, Madison Avenue, the, just the image, the, the culture from the States, it's really hard to avoid it or to, you know, have the money to do anything that competes with it. And, and actually, I'm always really happy when I go to somewhere like here or in February, I was in Mumbai in India, and I was really pleasantly surprised to see how independent they are. Like, they just have their own films, their own books, their own bad soap operas, you know, and Canada is just so much dependent on the states, um, and you know it's changed over my lifetime, but it's still there's still that feeling that's a, a branch plant mentality, and, and uh, the, I guess the advantage is you can blend in. You know, a lot of Canadians go to Hollywood, go to the states, and make it, and they they can just blend in really easily, and um, or a singer like Neil Young, Leonard Cohen, Joni Mitchell, they've done really well, but. Um, it's still, for a lot of people, you're, you're, you are kind of invisible in a way, but I think it's good for a writer to be invisible. I mean, I guess I'd like to be successful or more, but I think, it, I think it really you are good. accomplished, <laughs> awarded, um, I say, I mean, uh, this whole, you know, process, I sort of, I, I'll try to concretize a bit, and I, when I speak from this situation, I can't even, um, imagine what it takes, like in English language literature, um, you know, to 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 
to get to to a point where you do have some visibility when you're in talks for literary what is what you know I was talking about very you know concrete material mm -hmm. things like that how do you even enter the literary field and maybe the difference is com um, uh, when you compare the situation in the in the eighties when you when you were at your beginnings let's yeah. say. Uh, compared to now, maybe what what does it look like in Canada and North America? Well, it's kind of up and down. Like there was a real boom time in Canadian publishing around 2000. When my book 19 Knives came out, and I just thought it's going to just get better and better, and it, it didn't. Um, but you know, there was Michael and Dach, who was doing really well. Atwood, you know, Alice Munro. Um, I don't know. If, you know, Anne Marie MacDonald was doing quite well, and then they were selling books in Germany and Italy. And you know, so I knew some writers who were making more money in Finland than they were making in Canada for books. So there was this feeling you could actually get out there, but um, I don't know, it, it didn't keep going. So, and you mentioned the award list, the, the publishing. I don't know if it's the same in Europe, but in in Canada, the awards are everything now. Like if you don't make it onto an award list, the publishers almost won't talk to you. And, um, so I find it really frustrating because um, I'm kind of conceited at times and I'll be reading at a festival with people who got big awards and I think, well, I'm a better writer than that person, but they get the awards. But I think any field is like that. Music's probably like that. And so it can be frustrating, but it, you know, there's times it's great. Like, you know, I get to come here because I'm a writer, so I feel like I can't complain. You know, it's. Uh, but you know, when you write short story and you don't write really mainstream commercial, it's you know you have to do other things to to make a living. But that's not the end of the world. It's not the worst thing. But you've written a novel as well. Um, I've tried a couple times. But, <laughs> but you 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 um, sort of. Well, I'd say you succeeded with <laughs> at least one time, <laughs> and uh, you know this this novel, um, A Salvage King, yeah, was called uh, decisively non-Canadian or pro programmatically non-Canadian <laughs> by by some by some critics. And actually, I'm mentioning this because here in in Buxa we are often discussing you know the the notions of national literature, what mm -hmm. it even means, for example. To talk about Croatian literature, what's this yeah. national framework? What, what does it? Can we conceptualize it in other ways? And I know you have been critical outside of your fiction, um, also in, in in talks, interviews. You've been critical towards this um, sort of commercial and mainstream <laughs> notions of Canadian literature as a set of uh, themes and uh, uh, yeah. maybe. Um, so, so I, I'm interested to, yeah. to hear more about Yeah, that. well, I, I guess I've said before, I, I don't think about borders. I, I like good literature, you know, so to me it doesn't matter whether it's American or, you know, if it's a writer from Prague. I'm just interested in what I can learn or enjoy, and um, I'm definitely not going to, you know, keep up with Canadian books just because they're Canadian. There's got to be something that interests me. And, and then there's times there's, you know, you know, people might be anti-American in Canada, um, but uh, you know, I went to, as you said, I went to school in Iowa. It was a really good experience, and uh, there's some writers there that I found out about and read about that were big influences on me. And um, but you know, I, I'm a bit of a sponge. Like I like writers from all sorts of places. Um, you know, at one point Philip Ross did a series of um, just small Penguin paperbacks of writers from Eastern Europe, and and I loved those. It was you know it was. Street of Crocodiles and Bruno Schultz and uh, there's a bunch of others that I can't think of right now. So I don't think, you know, to me it's, it's you know, it's either good art or bad art. It's, it's not good Canadian. I agree, but what I was interested in and what I think um, a good part of our audience is interested in as well is what exactly are those notions that you dislike about Canadian literature. Let's put it under quotation marks. Uh, <laughs> What is it that you stand uh, against, if it's not too much to put it that way? Uh, what, what is this you know, I perception? I, I can't think of one thing. I think I'm against a lot. But, but there, there are times that Canadian books have certain touchstones. Like it's got to be about World War One, 
um, here where it has to have trees in it or um, I, yeah bears and bears can be good snow <laughs> yeah yeah and, well and, and the title story my white planet it, it's set way up north in fact you know right at Vanya's conference um, it's a radio station up, station up north but I don't know anything about the north in Canada you know I've been to I've been to India and I met these throat singers from the Arctic, and but I go to India to meet these people from the Arctic in Canada, um, so I'm kind of embarrassed about that in a way. Um, but at the university where I teach, we had a an award-winning writer come through, and she was reading a piece from a novel, and I found it really boring. It was it was people at a cottage on a lake, reading books and talking, and then. There was some action. Finally, a dog got run over, and I was like, "Thank God, the dog got run over." <laughs> well, it's a lesson actually for writers that if you want, you know, you kill a human, they may, uh, who cares? But you know, you, you kill a dog, it was ah. <laughs> so I always tell my writing students, you know, kill animals. It's it works. But, um, <laughs> uh, but that was an example where I thought this person is getting award after award, it was really well thought of, and yet what she was reading was just. I thought too quiet, too dull, and, and I don't think you have to blow things up, you know. But I think you've got to work on the language, work on the material, you know, think about it, or do something. I, I don't know, so it, it's definitely, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not alone. There are other people who, you know, like I, I think Russell Smith and the Globe and Mail's complained that you know there has to be so many things in a Canadian book, or and there's there's so much bad Canadian poetry, and it's got to have birds in it. And, they give grants for writing. Small towns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I grew up in some of that, you know. But yeah, they got the the grain elevator and the, the wheat field and um, and the bear coming through. I guess. <laughs> um, but I, uh, they give grants out for writing poetry, and I think they should actually give grants to not write poetry because I think okay. there's I think there's just too much already. Like there's no shortage. It's like. It like would be quite, a, full. quite an interesting artistic intervention, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> grant being awarded for not, <laughs> the best known poet. <laughs> yeah. um, but on the other hand, you do have ice hockey, for instance, and oh, yeah. whatsoever you, you, you've written a, a hockey themed novel. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because I saw, you know, it was ranked as a top hockey fiction book or the best hockey fiction book and I didn't even and you see there's a difference between small languages uh, small milieus big languages like I, I, I didn't even know there there was you know I know it, obviously a lot of fiction is about sports and about mm -hmm. hockey probably but that there was somewhere there was a hockey fiction list too <laughs> it's sort of you know from this perspective it's <laughs> amazing <laughs> Yeah, there aren't that many compared to, say, baseball. Like mm. the Americans in baseball, they, they really write a lot about it. Um, but there are, there are a number of hockey books over the years, but they don't get that much attention. So in Canada, you always hear this, how come someone hasn't written the great Canadian novel about hockey? And then I think, well, you don't know. There's these other ones here you don't even know about. And I don't know, there's kind of a cultural amnesia. And I, I don't know if it's changed. Like I, I feel when I was younger, books hung around longer. But I feel like now they just they've got this shelf life that's really fast and it's you know you've got to have something new or something out there or or you, you know, just they move on to something else or get forgotten. And it's not like it's not like I write sit at the desk at one in the morning writing going, This will be remembered, you know, I don't. Like uh, I usually just think of oh, this would be funny if I put that in or is that gonna be weird? But at one o'clock in the morning or I tend to write late at night, yeah. In fact I think your... if I wrote earlier I might do better. I might have birds and trees and <laughs> apples and things. I don't know. I've actually wondered about that a lot. I tend to write late. I think when things get quieter and I'm a bit of a night owl. So. You're a night uh, creative person. Well, I can write. I can write data. Like I, I always keep. I've got paper here. I've got paper there. A pen. And so if we're wandering around town here, you know, I'll, I'll stop and write stuff. And I don't know. Like um, we're. We were outside a church and there was a whole bunch of people smoking and, and then I went inside and there was a smell of incense in the church and it was kind of a nice shift actually. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know, and then there was the, uh, the aroma of uh, roasting chestnuts, you know, the, those kind of metal things and so I just, have to write, I just have to write things down that I, you know, bump into. 
because I don't have a good memory, so I, I have to always collect and collect. And, but then that way, I never have a blank page. You know, like I, I never sit there and go, "What should I write? How can I be sensitive?" You know, like I just have scrawled notes, and I just tend to think, "Okay, I'm gonna start start on this with a scene, an image." You mentioned that uh, some people go and say, "We don't have a hockey novel in Canada." Some somebody should write a hockey novel. But I'm, I'm curious, how can someone even say, like, from, from, from such, an, such a position of authority, oh, we don't have that in Canadian literature? I mean, how do you follow even everything that's published? Well, uh, yeah, you can. How can someone just say, oh, there's no book on this or that topic? Mm -hmm. And, you know, th that's what interests me too, you know, it's such a writing, but. If I go to a big box store, you know, I don't know if you know, like Chapters or these mm -hmm. really big box stores. And I, I've really enjoyed walking around the last day or two where I'll be on a street and there's two or three different bookstores. In Canada, that's gone. You know, it used to be like that, it's just gone. Um, but when I walk into Chapters, the big box store, I get depressed because there's so many books. I think, well, how do you make a dent? You know, it's like a grain of sand on the beach. and. Um, but then other times, as I said, you know, I think it's, it's really, it beats breaking rocks, you know, or, or other jobs I had in the past. Um, so I can't complain, but I like to complain, I think. <laughs> but interesting that you are mentioning your previous jobs. So what was it like before literature or alongside for a period of time? Yeah, well, I, I breaking, actually always Breaking thought, rocks, you said, sorry. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> but I, I just always compare, I think. Well, actually, I, when I was, I remember at one point in Victoria, if I was getting depressed about something, I'd think, well, at least there aren't any snipers. <laughs> so I always think, I can't really complain, because there, there aren't, it's not that bad. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I always thought I would have to work a job and write on the side. Because, um, you know, I took, I took some course in English and creative writing, but I didn't think, well, this is going to bring me a BMW or anything like that. Um, and I, I had a job driving a truck for the railroad in Edmonton in Alberta in the West and it was a pretty good job, it was good money and it was, you know, it was a good union and uh, so I just thought well I'll, I'll drive a truck and I'll write on the side and, and then it was really just fluke that I got into teaching. I, when I went to Iowa, uh, I applied to Iowa but I only did half the application and I was too lazy to do the whole application so I applied to the workshop but I didn't apply to the graduate school itself and it was two different applications and then um, I went traveling I was in Ireland and uh, and my mother phoned me at my aunt's place in Ireland and said uh, Iowa is called and you're accepted there and so I had to phone them from Ireland which was a big deal like you know telephones were at that point this was like 1981 I guess you know long distance I am sure it's really expensive it's not like now where everyone just had a phone at their disposal and uh, so I phoned and said, I'd love to come to Iowa, but I'm in Ireland right now. And I think they thought I was going to go to Trinity to school there, which I wasn't. I was just hanging around. Um, but they said, well, we can offer you uh, an RA or a TA if you come to Iowa. And it, it meant a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship. And it meant cheaper tuition, in-state tuition, and a small salary. So I said, OK, you know, I'll be there. And, and so the, the TA meant I had to actually teach a class, and I'd never done it before. Like, there was no preparation. I just got thrown in. And it wasn't like a teaching assistant assisting a professor. It was my class completely. So it was kind of fun, though. I, I felt it was like this. I thought, I just, it's got to be like a talk show. You know, I'll just keep them entertained if I can. And, um, so that was my entry How into teaching. Go? What's that? How did it go? It was, it was better than I thought. I was so nervous. Like I, I went in and I, I'd actually brought in a, a glass of ginger ale with me. And so I was talking to them, you know, introducing myself, and here's the book we'll look at. And then I went to pick it up and it was just like, little, 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 like a, it was shaking so much I couldn't even pick it up in front of the class. I had to just, that'll wait till later. I was really nervous, but um, you, you just get used to it if you do it enough. But, but it was a good experience because then I ended up later uh, getting I just started teaching part-time at colleges and things and then uh, I actually taught part-time for a long, long time and then the job I have now is more of a full-time.
So it's really good because it's I teach creative writing. I work on a magazine called The Fiddlehead. That's really good Canadian lit mag. So it's it's nice. It it sort of opens opens up space for a lot of more questions and. Uh, um, directions of, uh, in which to we could uh, you know direct this conversation so to speak but uh, first of all I'd like to ask if we have said some comments or questions yet uh, for Mark as 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 you can see he's uh, he's not shy <laughs> you can ask whatever you like intervene comment <laughs> Sorry? I'm, I'm thinking about it, yeah, I need a bit more. <laughs> it will come. Um, we can, you know, just slowly say, sail through the conversations and the topics and uh, <laughs> it, it, it will crystallize. But when you're mentioning creative writing, I mean, it's very interesting in, in these last 15 or 20 years, even in Croatia, um, creative writing workshops are so are a thing. We can say it's not completely unknown. It exists. Yeah. Uh, there are people. There are books. There are writers. There's an institution called Center for Creative Writing, mm. but it's not an academic institution of institution of any of any kind. Uh, whereas you, you are a graduate of the best known. I'd say at least in the English-speaking world, world um, such institution, the Iowa work, Writers' Workshop, yeah. and now you teach creative writing. So, I'd like your, um, you know, your thoughts on that. I, I, I'm sure it, it must be. You, you have a lot of things. You have a lot of say to say, and you, you had a lot of, uh, you know, um, things to think about all those years from, from, from this, these first experiences in Iowa mm -hmm. and to teaching creative writing now. So I'd like to hear your thoughts um, uh, pertaining to the place of creative writing in writing and literature, so, so to say, and on the other hand in the academia, in the you know, university or between those two, what, how exactly do you see them? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a big question. Um, because I worry sometimes that they're almost factories, you know, turning out creative writing degrees. And there's, a sort of, sorry, there's a sort of criticism we usually hear in these parts of the yeah. world, but something unusual still. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, on the other hand, there's this mystification of literature and sometimes obscurantism which says no there's nothing to teach there's yeah yeah that's a good question because I, I don't teach creative writing I just run a workshop but they, they get editing so so I, I mean sometimes people want a magic formula they want to pay a bit of money and I open up their skull and put in some magic formula and they can write but um, well, all I like to do is run a workshop where they hand in they have to write they have to hand in stuff they get maybe 10 or 12 people around a table who give them feedback. And when else in your life are you going to get actually any kind of editing or feedback? Um, so I think they're really valuable, but I do worry that there's a bit of a factory system going where there's just more and more and more. Um, Flannery O'Connor had a great line where someone said, you know, do you think, uh, you know, universities of the academic world kind of stymie uh, writers and and she said I don't think they stymied enough you know like she she was something like me thinking there's no shortage you know there's enough writers out there um, but I I, I kind of came up through workshops and I, I found it really handy like uh, if I had stayed in my parents basement for 10 years I wouldn't have found out the things that I found out in a few months in a workshop and it sounds negative, but I really learned what not to do. Like I learned how to avoid cliche, sentimentalism. There was just things, you know, you know, you just find out people say, or they might even say that dialogue, 
I don't think humans speak like that. And then you look at it and go, ah, they're right. How did I not see that? It's hard to read and judge your own writing. And so I think anytime you can get some decent feedback, and I always tell my students I have a 10% rule. You, you might have to ignore a lot of what you hear around the table. Because one person's going to say, I love that scene. Another person's going, I hate that scene. And so as a writer, you've got to decide that. But it makes you think about it. And so I would say, if you, even 10% of the feedback you get is good, you're ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get way more than 10%, but I always think even if you just get that much. So, so I'm kind of a fan of the workshop, but I'm not a fan of there's some magic formula for writing, because everyone is different, and everyone's got to find out how to make it work for them. But, but my first collection of stories, most of them came because I had a workshop where a teacher said, you know, you, you have to write two or three stories this semester and and so I think well what the hell am I going to write and so I'd write stuff that I wouldn't have written otherwise but you know, so you know I guess I get contradictory where I'm saying there's no shortage of writing but I also think if you are going to it's it's just a valuable way to get feedback and editing so I don't see the workshop as anything evil or you know uh, tainted somehow and I also think even if you don't make it as, even if you don't win the Nobel Prize like Alice Munro did, um, if someone's playing guitar, like and getting some guitar lessons, and they get a little bit better, they don't have to be Jimi Hendrix, you know? They can just play guitar and enjoy it. And I think writing is like that too. You don't have to be Margaret Atwood, you can just work on your writing a bit and, and there should be something enjoyable about that. So, so I, I'm kind of split on that debate, but I, I, I have to say I'm a fan of workshops and and I, I came up to workshops and I teach workshops and so I think they're not perfect, you know, but there's, I don't think there's anything monstrous going on there. It's interesting because I know some um, creative writing manuals are really formula based, yeah. like they give a pattern yeah. on how, on like on how to, to and uh, yeah. what's interesting to me is that you said that uh, yeah. you most valuable experience from creative writing, studying creative writing or attending bookshop, uh, workshops, sorry, is precisely that not a certain formula or pattern mm -hmm. that you've been taught, but that you learned uh, what to avoid. Yeah. So what not to do. Yeah, which sounds negative, but it's actually very helpful. But yeah, when I was in Mumbai, India, I was doing a class there and, and then at the break, the organizer came up to me and said, you know, well, usually the instructor gives them some exercises, you know, how to write something. And, and I'm, I'm philosophically against that because I always think, well, Margaret Atwood doesn't phone me up and say, Mark, I don't know what to write. Give me an exercise. Like, she has things she wants to write about. And if you don't have those things, that's fine. But, uh, you know, I don't know, like... This is a stupid example, but I, I have a lot of friends who are poets, and I always bug them about poetry. But, but there's, a, there's a thing they've been doing lately, lately, erasures. I don't know if anyone knows this, but you take an existing poem, you erase parts of it, and, and make new poems out of it. I've heard a bit about it. And I just think, what the fuck? Why would you do that? You know? like, why not write a good new poem, or just not write at all, you know, or take up painting or something? But maybe after you fill in for what you erased, then yeah. you can erase the rest too and then fill in, you know, well, maybe just that's part by point. part you substitute that's a good point, yeah. A poem. Okay. And you never know what will happen, like, you know, I, I think it's, I guess the way I judge something is if it works, you know. If erasure leads to something amazing, then I'm saying, okay, that's good, it works, you know. And, and I'm the same with workshops, I don't think there's any formula, it's just what works for this story, what works for that person. You know, so, it's not a perfect system, but... But do you, do you find your students, <clears throat> sorry, do you find your stu stu students um, usually come with a certain, um, you know, expectations that maybe can't be met, that you have oh, to yeah. um, demystify uh, things a bit or uh, just put, put everybody back to earth again? Does it happen? Yeah. Uh, what are the expectations? I'm, I'm asking because, you know, in the English speaking world, world, uh, creative writing workshops and uh, um, studying creating writing already has a certain tradition, so mm -hmm. I would expect for a couple of generations at least um, 
people are at least to a certain degree acquainted with what they can expect but yeah it, it depends on the level like uh, I teach graduate students um, at the University of Brunswick and they come from different places and they kind of know what they're getting into but then I also teach first year second year third year undergraduate and to them it's often a complete mystery they just think well I like I like Game of Thrones or I, there's something I like and so I, I want to go into creative writing and um, I have to remind myself that the idea of a workshop, even the word workshop, is not familiar to them and I'm so used to it, like I've just known it for decades and so I, I have to remind myself that they don't even know what it is, that I have to explain you will write a story, you will make you know copies or email us copies and a week later, we'll sit around this table and talk about so your it's story. So not common knowledge, is it? Not for the so undergrad almost, level, yeah. no. And, and you know, where I am is not in the big city, so um, yeah, it's, it's not it's not just kind of in the air. I think if you were in Toronto or Vancouver, it'd probably be a little more common. But I'm in quite a small small place. Mark, you left us with a sort of a cliffhanger. Um, I'd like. Um, you to read another segment maybe but it doesn't have to be a continuation it can be you can you know um yeah i don't know what i just do go for things. whatever you like i have a very depressing piece about migrants drowning off italy and that might be too much um i've got a later piece um from the point of view of a stewardess on a plane and i've got a couple small it's out of uh, Knife Party, the, the newest book, so I don't know. Are we making a poll? Do we have <laughs> votes? <laughs> immigrants? Which one? Immigrants. Just immigrants? You really want immigrants? Okay, it's, it's depressing. <laughs> Keep us authentic then. Yeah. At least there's some votes. They're, they're leaving. But it's, in, but it's in your it's new piece. <laughs> yeah. So. I went to, uh, to Italy to teach a summer course. Um, can everyone hear me without the mic? Is that all right? Yeah. Um, and I, I was just fascinated um, and wanted to write something about it. And in, in a way, indirectly, it led to me traveling around this area because I'd never been this way before. But I, to save money, I, saved, I stayed in Trieste a little bit. And, and then uh, I ended up, because of Jason up in Ljubljana and Vanya here, ended up traveling to a couple other places. and. Uh, so I just kind of got to know more of an area than, than really originally I thought. But I, I just knew I wanted to write about Italy. And this was kind of before um, Syria was in the news. But I was very much aware that there were a lot of immigrants trying to get into Italy and Greece. And at this point, they were more from Afghanistan, Iraq, and, de and definitely North Africa. But um, it's a little bit before um, it was big news. and. Um, I was just interested because as a tourist myself, I could you know go from Venice to Trieste to Ljubljana, and go up to Vienna, and in fact I I rode in a train up to Krakow for about eleven hours just to have a beer with someone I knew up there. Uh, but you know it was, it was so easy for me, and and I was just thinking there's people dying like trying to do the same thing that I can do so easily, and so I wanted to write something where I have tourists kind of meeting that that issue or that problem so so that's that's where this came from and um, there's just a tiny detail at the end where there's a, a dead uncle and a, a chestnut canoe mentioned at the very end and I just wanted that image there but this this is actually a shorter part out of a, a longer story called Adam and Eve saved from drowning um, but the, the dead uncle was killed in Italy in World War II. A lot of Canadians died in Italy in World War II, and it, it doesn't get the same attention that, say, D-Day or the invasion of France gets. Um, and a lot of Canadians from the area where I now live, I'm not from there, but it's the Maritimes is considered the East Coast, and a lot of them served in Italy. Very tough, very tough campaign. So he's just mentioned there, because he's, he's kind of hovering in the background, in a way. Okay, so this is from Adam and Eve, Saved from Drowning. My cousin Eve and I rent kayaks, and cold seawater runs down the paddles onto my arm. 
and my hips soaked in easy waves and this cooling breeze so welcome in Italy's murderous greenhouse. It's lovely on the water, the shallows, such beautiful shades of emerald, azure, jade, and cobalt. Even I kayak a new coast threading islands, and we see so far and glide so smoothly, and cover such distances without engine noise or oily exhaust. Our long conjoined paddles dip in the sea and lift dripping in the sun. Kayaking is like snow skiing and it alters me so quickly, it makes me happy that the natural world can be so exhilarating, my lungs full of fresh air and my eye full of beauty. Sand, cliff, sand, cliff, the sun setting as Eve and I spin in easy circles and drift and drink water, kayaks tied together near noisy mobs of pale-throated birds, and that night we sleep like children under sea. In our chamber we sleep so warmly while a larger night ship waits off the coast in strong seas. A smaller boat moves away and struggles in the darkness. The open boat bobs and yaws, tilts in the rocks and pours them out before the passengers are at shore. They are thrown from the boat as it capsizes in white surf on the dark land like lace at a neck. On a beach Eve and I share black cherry juice and pale bread and buffalo mozzarella and then we kayak past cliffs and a sunlit village and beach. And over there, should we stare or look away? We glide past men roped to each other in the surf, men searching the water for bodies, and three bodies already laid in a row on the sand of the beach, three bodies in sodden coats drowned near this narrow accumulation of sand under the cliffs. Men with mustaches with suitcases of wet sand glued to their black coats, this crescent beach was not their destination, but now they're stopped on the sand, their mouths stopped. Now they're at their destination. Their skiffs sank in riptides and long lines of spray. Their hands let go and their mouths let in the sea and sky. Far offshore, a red zodiac inflatable lifts on rhythmic waves. Do you know what I mean, zodiac? It's like an inflatable boat. Um, scuba divers surfing scene around a boat. While well, the divers gathered like gleaming seals, diving for pearls, diving for our cafe's seafood, we paddle closer and then Eve steers away sharply. Her eyes are better than mine. I don't know if I can understand the scene on the water. Divers and floating bodies tethered to a boat, a rope tied to each body so they don't drift away from the red inflatable. A drowned man floats on his back beside the Zodiac in a short sleeved shirt, his face under the water, his face almost under the bobbing boat. I don't want the hull to hit his face. The man's face is under the waves, but two clenched hands reach out of the waves toward the sky, his head under water, but his big arms lifted up in the air. Now does that make any sense in terms of evolution or human design? A rope is tied to the man's shirt and runs to the open fingers of his left hand, as if he's grasping the rope, doing his bit to help the divers. Herring gulls float on the rolling surface as a diver holds up a small girl from the water, and a uniformed man balancing inside the boat takes the girl in his hands. She's perhaps ten, has a long black braid, and seawater runs from the braid into the boat, her jacket and hair dripping water, water running off her face. A gull stares. The little girl's eyes are closed as if she's calmly sleeping, her large closed eyelids, her small fingers, the sea of beautiful azure, and the dead girl so quiet in the uniform man's tender arms. The drowned girl makes me think of the Piatella Chapel hidden in that Napoli alley, the delicate details in stone of San Martino's Christ lying under a thin shroud. How can it be one piece of marble suggesting both body and veil? Eyelids and fingers, a mother gave birth to a daughter, this tiny wet creature slipping from between her legs like a tadpole and pulled from silky water and now a man stands in a boat, a girl lifted in his arms, a lamb is offering to the wide summer sky. This man's motor launch and its strange cargo, this turquoise sea and golden light of tourist brochures. Can death visit here? This pleasing sea rolling under the summer sun, the water muscled like muscles and curves on a living body. A diver visits the sea and ties a person to the rise and fall of a motorboat. Will the mother grieve, or did the mother also drown here, thus spared the sight of her daughter? She and her family were so close to the shore, so close to Hotel Europa. Daughter, mother, father, tell me, did you learn to swim in your village in the far desert? No. Their flat desert was sea bottom once, but that doesn't help these travelers with this sea bottom. 
Where are they from? Who knows? Sand blowing in the desert and sand roiling under the sea. The surf comes strolling to them, sea ringing to stars and comets. They brought nothing with them. They are moving, untethered astronauts. Hurry, get to land, get sand under your boots. But where in the riptides is the bottom? We begin in a warm sea and we end in the cold. The girl with the braid so peaceful now, but villagers heard screaming in the dark under the cliffs. The villagers couldn't see where the migrants rolled in water and rocks. And now in daylight, these people collected on ropes. Now in daylight, the girl's dark braid dripping seawater, and bodies and babies roll in the waves like glossy dolphins. Are they from Iraq, Tunisia? The family came so close, and I wonder, will they be buried in Italian soil, remembering words carved on the poet's gravestone in the Protestant cemetery? Here lies one whose name was writ in water. Eve can't watch the divers do their work. Eve glides away in a bright kayak, and I follow her hearing an old blues tune. Reverend Gary Davis's raspy voice stuck in my head. Death don't have no mercy. Death don't take a vacation in this land. In this land of vacation, in this perfection, our moving boughs whisper water's music, and Eve whispers childhood prayers under the walled cliffs. And I try to remember the childhood words, and our dead uncle and his dog follow us on the water in a ribbed chestnut canoe. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I believe this is a case of, you know, um, how context can get ahead of an author sometimes. You said it was written uh, before Syria was in the news, before the talk of refugees. Yeah. Became this this you know omni omnipresent, and now now that you're reading this in this moment, it sort of you know fits into this broader context. And yeah. sadly, you know mm -hmm. things we are familiar with, and from the news, yeah. but also a lot of people hear from their own refugee experience in yeah. the 90s. -ish. Yeah, I felt I had mixed feelings about reading it after there was the famous photo of the kid on the beach, mm -hmm. you know, and. And I was reading it before that, and then when that happened, I just thought, ah, this almost seems exploitative or something. And then I let some time go, and then, I don't know, I just thought, well, I kind of want to read that piece anyways. But, but yeah, it was published in a magazine, I think back around 2010 or 2011, something like that. But, you know, if you were in the area, and I'm sure you were aware of it here, but when I was in Italy, it was a big deal. Like, they were saying, you know, we're just swamped, we can't take this. But in... North America or England, it wasn't the same sense that it was a big deal, and and I think there was a feeling that in Italy they felt that the North was just you know going to turn them back, or I don't know, there was some resentment that the North didn't seem to care at all, and so yeah, it was as I said, I, I just noticed that I could move so easily, and I thought there's these people dying at the exact same time, so I wanted to try and get characters right yeah, into freedom it. Freedom of movement is something I think a lot to do with yeah. traveling like that. But yeah. now, especially now with the European Union passport and on the other yeah. hand. Yeah. And uh, it, to me it's the oldest story, you know, like migration or moving it. It's the oldest, oldest story. Yeah. I remember well, reading this thing about steam sim. Yeah. And I remember reading about how it wouldn't take very long from someone moving out of Africa over say generations to get to India, just walking along the shore. That it wouldn't take that long if you just did so much, you know, every every year, every generation, and I hadn't thought about that, that, you know, it was just people moving, and it's like, what's around that corner, what's around that corner, and, and yeah, so then to try and stop that, I don't know, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, Vanya, have you thought of your question? <laughs> yes, thank you, I have. Great. Um, you pay a lot of attention to language, in terms of rhythm, in terms of sound, in terms of imagery, a lot of metaphors. And I know that you were are a poet as well. So how much of the rhythm, uh, perhaps it's slightly less obvious in the immigrant story, but in mm -hmm. life party, it's very, very yeah. Good. How, yeah. to what extent is it deliberate or conscious effort on your part, or it just kind of feels right? Yeah, I guess I kind of like it. Um, but I, I do, when I first started writing, I didn't hear the writing. And then, then I had to do some readings, and again, it was like teaching. I just got thrown out with no preparation, and, and 
So this reading copy, you can see like I cross out things that are going to trip me up. I've got arrows going down and, and I've got, I, I, I tend to read too fast. So I've got slashes and stop, don't throw this line away. And you know, I, like was, I, was, I was wondering what those uh, yeah. slashes were. And holding up the lamb, I've got lamb underlined so that I don't, you know, just throw it away kind of. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I think when I was actually, when I, we're talking about workshops, my very first workshop, the teacher, the instructor, he said of a, another woman's story, there's really nice rhythm here. And I was saying, I don't know what he means. Like, I don't know what he means by that rhythm. And, and so I think now I do think a lot more about it. And yeah, I, I did one slim volume of poetry when I was you know, younger and more sensitive. Um, but uh, it, I felt like throwing a book down a well. It didn't you know, really go anywhere. And I just, I just thought I'm gonna use the same words and images and language in fiction or nonfiction or travel writing or anything. Um, but poetry is definitely an influence. Like I love to bug my friends who are poets, um, but it's it's an influence, you know. I, there's I don't know if anyone knows an American writer, Dennis Johnson, but he he did poems before he did some stories. He did a collection of stories called Jesus' Son. It's really great. It was um, translated here. Was it? It was translated in Croatia. Oh great. Published, yeah. Oh great. Um, it's a really good collection of stories, but when I was at Iowa, that was one of the writers I bumped into. He'd been there just about a year before, so I didn't meet him, but he, I was aware of him. He did a collection of poems called The Incognito Lounge, and I loved them, and they, they made me want to write. And I think writers like that are really valuable, that where they spark you, and not every writer's going to do it. It depends on every individual, but um, so definitely an influence. And if I have to choose words, well, here's an example. Our long conjoined paddles dip in the sea and lift dripping in the sun. So there's dip and dripping in the same sentence. And so if I have a choice of words, I'll go for M sounds that are going to run into each other, or S sounds, or, or an internal rhyme, or a, an off rhyme, or half rhyme. But I don't, I hope I don't obsess over it, but I, I do kind of like to play with that. And I, I'm terrible with plot. Like I, I cannot think of plot, you know. I read people have great plots, and I read Jane Austen and go, what a great twist, what a great story, you know? And uh, I think, but I can't do it, so I, I feel like I have to work on other, other things to compensate in a way. And so I think imagery, language, is one way to compensate for not having a lot of plot. Because this is really, it's just people paddling around and they see something, you know, but, so, I don't know. Yeah, because, no, because occasionally it reads like a prose poem. Yeah. And then you, you, in my opinion, balance out well those parts that are that where language is very foregrounded. And yeah. There's a lot of rhythm and poeticism. It's not a word. Okay. And going on, and then maybe it, there is an allow in terms of more just regular language. Yeah. Or sometimes language. just have a dialogue too. Yeah. yeah. And then then they pop up, and I think they add. Interesting rhythm, and I wouldn't say yeah. that your plot is. You have interesting plots as well, but that language definitely adds a lot. It adds a lot. Yeah, yeah well, that's good. But yeah, there, there's even a rhythm to me to a whole story too, and so you can't, like you say, you can't have just you know poetic image, poetic image. You know, you've got to, you say, have a break, and then and then I'll scroll down and look. You know, because sometimes I just have an image, like the roasting chestnuts. So like where. Where is that going to go? The smoke and the aroma, and um, so could it go there? Maybe could it go there? You know, so I'm, I'm always kind of looking, and sometimes it's just a gut feeling that you know that it's not right there, but it's right there, and I don't know why. I love moving pieces around and see how they bump into each other, how they resonate, because I I think you can really change a story by just moving things around. Even move the end to the beginning, or or you know, I use a frame around it, and so. I kind of enjoy that part. I really like, you know, I like working on a rough draft and, and uh, I like printing it out. I know a lot of people write on machine. I, I mean, I write on a laptop, but then I print it out and I carry it around with me. And I just feel it's really useful to have it with me and mark it all up and then go back. And in fact, I, I read that Ray Carver used to pay someone to take his marked up ones and type them up and give him a fresh copy, and then he'd start over again. I thought, what luxury, that would be so great. Have someone just keep bringing you fresh copies, but you, you get to do the, the editing and the marking up. Sorry, I have to interfere. I believe that that is one of the most important, uh, important, um, uh, how should I say, uh, 
uh, phases in, in, in writing or uh, which a lot of a lot of writers and I don't mean only fiction writers but people you know writing uh, any sort of any sort of text often skip uh, because that's that's my advice for you know also uh, I give to a lot of people asking me about um, uh, writing either criticism or um, academic stuff or I believe uh, it's very important to print it out because mm -hmm. only then you can see your you can see your uh, text when you see it on paper it's not the same thing and, it, and yeah. obviously from um, Carver's year up until now we've luckily progressed to, mm -hmm. we can print our out mm -hmm. our own copies for relatively in a relatively uh, low budget arrangement yeah. we can have our and work on it. I, yeah. So, so so you do it. It's it's a you know it's a staple of yours. Oh yeah. Your creative. Process. I do both. You know. I mean, I, I have a laptop, and you know, I, and there's times I can't wait to almost start a doc and see how it looks. Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes you know you write something even by hand, and I think, oh, I'm going to send this to the New Yorker, and then you know, you print it out. It's like, why did I mm -hmm. think I was going to send this to the New Yorker? <laughs> um, but yeah, so this this kind of I like both, but it may be a generational thing though. But I, I get a lot of students who only write on the screen on the machine, and I I think you have to do both because yeah, there's times that I think something's working perfectly well on the screen, like even a book review, and then I print it out and I go, well, there's no transition. This isn't working, and I can't figure out. I can't see it on the screen. I, mean, I think some people probably can, but uh, I can't. Uh, it's interesting because me 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 neither, and I don't I don't write fiction. Uh, I don't write in English, so it's not. I'm from a ge geographically different area, so it's two completely different contexts. Yeah. But same thing. And I, I, uh, um, I grew up writing writing on a computer, so yeah. it's not that I had to switch from yeah, a typewriter yeah. or something. But it's just that um, I, I I don't see the you know as you say I don't see the the, the larger picture until yeah. I yeah. have it in paper. Yeah, I don't know why that's interesting. Is. And I mean, cut and paste is the best thing in the world. Because you know, before computer, <laughs> oh yeah, before computer, I would literally do it with scissors and tape. You know, just because I wanted to move things around. And so, so, so when cut so and paste arrived, it was like from. this was made for me. You know? <laughs> so that's where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not, a, I'm not a complete Luddite, or I'm not completely anti-technology, but I think you need the mix. Mm. Another question, question? comment. A question. I'm also a Canadian, and uh, you mentioned you're you're Mr. Creole. Yes. You mentioned that here at uh, Booksa, mm -hmm. often you're speaking with authors from the region, so yes. people from you know, Osiak or Split or Sarajevo or Belgrade or Novi Sad or Pristina, and mm -hmm. these are places that are fairly well known to the group at Booksa. Well, you, you mentioned, Mr. Jarman, you're from a place called Frederick, yeah. which I, I think should be less familiar to the, to the group here. Unless I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if anyone knew of it. So uh, I'd be interested, since we have you here and, and you're uh, relaxed and you're willing to talk, uh, maybe would you mind applying a little bit to your creative sensibility and, and telling us what Frederick is like? I don't know. I when I first moved there, I thought it was too small. Um, I don't know if you know that movie, The Truman Story, where it's all a film set, and then if you go far enough, you hit a wall. I I had that feeling, and uh, um, but then I really got used to it, and I, I always joke that it's it's made me a hick because I I don't know if you know that expression, but it's changed the scale of my brain. I now think smaller is much better. And if I go to Toronto, I have fun, I enjoy it, but I think this is not healthy. Millions of people, you know, living on top of each other. And so it's, it's been a really good fit, I guess. Um, you know, it's a small town, but there's, there's university and there's government. So you get the advantages of that. You get an art gallery, you get better restaurants and beer and things. And, and there's been an explosion, it's probably the same thing here, in the microbrew, in good beer. It's, it's just, in fact, there's very little industry in New Brunswick that's going well except microbrews. <laughs> it's like, you know, logging has gone down, fishing has gone down, all these things have gone down, the old traditional kind of 
sources of jobs, but the, the micro routes are doing really well. But you know, there's a big river. We were talking about kayaks, and uh, the St. John River goes right in front of my house, and there's a walking bridge. In fact, in this, in this book, I've got a short story. When I first moved to Fredericton, a skateboarder fell off the walking bridge and drowned, and I was really interested. And there was a bunch of graffiti on the bridge that I collected. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I wanted to do something with it. So it's really, technically, it's probably an essay on the death of this skateboard, but it's also about the river, local history, and um, so I don't know what else to describe, but it's, um, I teach at the university and it's got creative writing, whereas at the University of Victoria on the west coast, I was teaching a lot of first year English, really basic composition, and I might have three sections, you know, with 90 essays to mark, and it, I'd have to get them marked and get them back before the next batch of 90 came in a week later, and it was like some minor circle of hell or heck, mm -hmm. and, uh, so Fredericton was great because it had more creative writing, and, and I work on the magazine I mentioned, The Fiddlehead. That's really nice. And, uh, I can ride my bike and walk everywhere. I rarely have to drive a car, but I don't drive it very much. And so I think it's really, really nice, and I'm, I'm working on a bunch of travel stories that include this area and Italy and um, also Mumbai that I mentioned, and, and I'm hoping Shanghai and Korea. I was in a, a city in, in Korea called Songdo. It's a, a city of the future, so-called, brand new. Like, it's the biggest real estate development in the world. They just built a whole new city to have it by the airport and have a financial center. So I kind of want to do a bunch of travel pieces, but one thing that keeps coming up is I'm starting to value New Brunswick and Fredericton more and more, because they go to Mumbai, and there's the population of Canada in a little area, and half of them don't have toilets, you know, and I think, you know, maybe New Brunswick's not so bad after all. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually trying to make it a travel book, but I, I find New Brunswick keeps coming in more and more. So they should hire me to, you know. <laughs> advertise. Yeah, to advertise it. Um, but can you think of any other specifics about Fredericton? Because I mean, the rest of Canada doesn't care that much about. New Brunswick is seen as a kind of a have-not province, or the one that you drive through to go to Montreal, to Halifax, or Halifax to Montreal. And, um, so it's got a reputation. It's not it's not the trendiest province in Canada, but I really got to like it, and I, I think it's just been a good fit for me. Well, I, I wanted to hear what you would uh, come up with off the cuff like that, because it's something I, I struggle with in my job: how to describe to an audience that doesn't know much about Canada, or to yeah. uh, um, an interlocutor that doesn't know much about Canada, how to describe it in a way that is really evocative and will leave an impression. What what is Canada? I come from a place called Saskatchewan. So what is that? Oh yeah, whereabouts? Uh, I grew up in a town called Saskatoon. Oh yeah. So for the Paris of the Prairies. It is. <laughs> <laughs> for those, here, here's what I've come up with to explain where Saskatoon is. You've heard of Toronto. You've heard of Vancouver on the west coast. Mm -hmm. The distance between is at 5,000 kilometers. I come from a place in between. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where I am, on the East Coast, it's four hour time difference if I'm phoning someone in Ireland, mm -hmm. and it's four hour time difference if I'm phoning someone in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, as, <laughs> I'm as close to Ireland as I am to Vancouver. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and Newfoundland's even closer. Like Newfoundland's almost, you could jump there, and then you're, you're in Iceland. From Ireland to Ireland. Almost, yeah. Take a kayak. Uh, it, 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 it has interesting, I believe it has interesting implications for literature as well, this sense of space and, yeah. of, you know, these, these wastelands and, you, and it, it, cities, but also nature and uh, yeah. wastelands and the prairie and, you know, all, the, all, all, all that space, for instance, you know, when you, you're looking for a location to set a story in or yeah. you are just interested in exploring, you know, uh, different experiences and uh, visions of living in Canada or of what Canada is. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I believe it has very interesting uh, and meaningful uh, implications on a, on a perhaps more narrow literary, literary sense, uh, you know.
it's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <wait. laughs> But you do, but you do uh, travel a lot. We've heard it even from your uh, uh, answers and replies to questions that weren't mm. travel related. So yeah. let me ask you a travel related question. Sure. Um, so I know you, you, you like to travel a lot. You uh, get a lot of inspiration, topics, imagery, as we've seen mm -hmm. from your travels from from Europe, more specifically, you do, do and do <laughs> Southeastern Europe, Southern Europe, uh, Italy, as we've seen. Right now, you run a travel, as you said, from uh, Venice, right? Through, yeah. through Ljubljana, Zagreb, and yeah. then Trogir and Split, I suppose. The, yeah, yeah, the I haven't, Asia I haven't and been to Split, so we're, we're definitely going to explore. So I haven't been there yet. I've been to Trogir and Okru, but, but I didn't. I don't know why I didn't make it to split. But this this trip, I will. And it's your third time in Croatia. It is, yeah, yeah. And I know it, 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 there has been some Cro Croatia, how should I say, Croatian imagery or Croatia-related uh, imagery and uh, themes already incorporated in your work. And yeah. there are rumors that yeah. you are going to to do some some more and this is not maybe only a holiday but a sort of a work holiday so um, I like yeah. something on that well I, I Banyu knows a piece I wrote that's kind of a silly piece but it's on meat it was a magazine in Vancouver that asked me to write a piece on meat and and so I thought well when I was traveling this area there was lots of meat you know there's <laughs> like platters of meat and uh, so I thought I'll try that, but I didn't know I didn't know how to do it. I, I was kind of stalled with it, and then I started making everything made of meat. The airplane was made out of meat. My passport was made out of meat, and there was you know like a, a possible illegal refugee gets stopped by the police in Trieste. And they open his passport, his pastrami, and they're like, oh, he's okay, he's good. And, um, so that was the only way I could somehow write was to go over the top or kind of ridiculous, and and then it was liberating. It just kind of rolled after that. But I hope I can do something. A little more, you know, serious or, or you know, observant somehow of that. But yeah, I definitely want to want to use my travels and, and actually this piece, I started the, this book. I started before I came here because it was it was Rome 2008. But the hotel I stayed at had Croatian chambermaids, so I was really interested. I was talking with them and kind of asking, you know, like what it was like where they were from and were they saving money to go back and. And one was actually saving money to go to London, England, and she needed a lot of money for that. And so it was kind of on my radar, and I was look at the map and think, okay, there's, there's, here's Italy, and then right across the water, the Adriatic, there's the coast of Croatia. So I kind of had it on my map even before I, I ever came here. And so then when it worked out that invites would work out, you know, first Ljubljana, then, then Zagreb, um, I was quite happy to do it and to, to come back, and I hope to, to still come back. The Mumbai one was different. That I, I got an email and I thought it was, you know, like a Nigerian banking scam or something. It was, you know, <laughs> you want to come to, to Mumbai, and I was like, oh, is that a catch to this? You know, I'm not sure. But it was legit. It was the Canadian consulate there asking. They said, if I wanted to, they could get me invited to this Kalagoda Arts Festival, but they wanted to know if I was interested before they suggested me. So I said, yeah, go ahead, because I just thought, well, I, I had no plans to go to India. It's not somewhere I would pick on my own. And, um, but I thought, well, this is my chance to, to do it. So, so I went, and uh, I, I'm working on it. It's in my backpack right now. I'm working on a piece. I've been working on it since February. And it's not done, but it just keeps going and going. And I didn't even spend that long. That's a ridiculous thing. I wasn't. I was only there about eight days, and I ended up with this long piece. I don't know how, but it grew. Some, yeah, 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 yeah. And sometimes you write a really short piece, and other times it keeps going. Mm -hmm. and so, I, as I mentioned before, I, I can't say that I was really happy in Mumbai all the time, but it was really interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm glad I saw it, but uh, it, it makes me worry about the future because it's just so crowded, so many cars, and pollution, and lack of plumbing, and, and uh, you know, then I was in China seeing the same problems, and just thinking, you know, something has got to change, like, we can't just keep getting millions and millions of people, and that's why I said New Brunswick, you know, like, there's just tons, of you know, the river goes by, and I wouldn't drink out of the river, but it's not, it's not terrible, and um, there's so much space, and 
and that's seen as negative in Canada. You know, it's seen as that's that's the depressed province that doesn't have industry or jobs, and and my students and my sons have to move elsewhere. I've got one son teaching in Korea, so that's why I ended up there. Um, but it's it's really made me value actually what could be seen as negative. You know, just that that idea that there's nothing going on there. Ah, that's nice. You know, like, and no one's honking their horn at me all the time. And, yeah, and, uh, so sometimes there's a privilege of happier and more stable societies if not, nothing is going on. And, yeah, but it's uh, not forever. Like, you know, some people hate Frederick to want to get the hell out. They've got to go to the big city, go somewhere else. But, but I think maybe later, it just depends on the individual, but later you come to appreciate actually sitting around doing nothing seems this is not bad. You know? But also something I was aiming at a bit with my question is um, given the fact that you have a travel book on Ireland, oh, yeah. are maybe all those experiences that you 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 are telling us about right now, uh, will it maybe be the material for another book of this kind or another project of? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to sell my publisher because I, I I signed a two book deal with my publisher, so this was the first book. Mm -hmm. The second one was on a an area of Canada. I don't know if anyone has heard of it, but the Gaspé Peninsula. And it's, it's Quebec, just above New Brunswick where I live, and it's a beautiful peninsula. And I went to it just to see it, because I'd heard about it all my life, and I thought, well, I'm pretty close, I'm just gonna go see it, and it was beautiful. So I thought, okay, I wanna write about this. And I pitched the idea to the Toronto newspaper, the Globe and Mail, to Canadian Geographic magazine, to Walrus magazine, which is kind of the best glossy mag in Canada. And they all said, no, we've done something, or, or you know, we've got a staff writer doing something. And so I realized it was actually easier for me to pitch the idea as a book than as a travel article. Mm -hmm. And I envisioned a book with beautiful pictures and me doing a tiny bit of writing. And my publisher said, no, more writing, a few pictures. I was like, okay. And so it was going to be the whole book on the Gaspé Peninsula, and I had lots of material, some really interesting stories and real connections to, to France and uh, cod fishing and, and Nazi U-boats in World War II were dropping spies off in Canada. I don't know what they were going to do. I don't know what they were. And one guy, he got dropped off and he had a roll of cash. He'd, he'd been a miner in Canada before and went back to Germany, and in the war they said, you're going back to Canada as a spy. He was like, okay took this roll of cash, he got to Montreal, and then he lived in a brothel, do you know what I mean by brothel, with this roll of cash for about two years, and never did any spying, didn't want to do any spying, but it's just some great stories, but anyways. It's a novel, but Yeah, but then I guess I went to Mumbai, and wrote a piece about it, I wrote the, the piece Meat and, Met, Met, Meat and Metal, like heavy metal in Metal Europa, and, and Desire stuff, and I just thought, I think I'd like to do a a collection of these and then my editor said well that's okay but we want a narrative thread we don't want just you plunk down separate pieces we want it to have you in it and somehow work through and so I said well, sort I of that. Of some kind yeah so it, you know it could even be that you know uh, when I was in Zagreb I was reminded of well you know we were at a place for a beer and they saw a big Samsung TV screen, and I didn't know that was Korean until I went to Korea, mm -hmm. and then I realized, and the Galaxy phones, mm -hmm. there was an announcement on a, on a plane, you can't have a Galaxy phone on the plane because they're worried that it'll melt or blow up, and those are Korean, really? and, yeah, and so there were all these products I didn't know were Korean until I went there, but then I've now seen them everywhere I go, and so I, I want to link it, I, I just have to find it, I haven't done that yet, but I, I want to link all the different parts, and so I, that's what my plan is to have a, a book that's a bunch of pieces, but somehow. So it is a working holiday of sorts. You are looking for yeah. a framework a bit. Yeah, to, it's a holiday, and, and I'm always work. collecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm always collecting. Right. And I'm always happy to have stories or contacts. And, um, you know, Vaughn and Jason and other people helped me. Like, with the, I got a list of heavy metal bands in <laughs> Croatia for my meetings. <laughs> Depending there, on the kindness of strangers. There, are there questions on the horizon? Do, do we see questions, comments? Uh, in the British questions. Um, sure. Probably poor music, but otherwise I'm fine.
Or it's is that like a Heavy metal. <laughs> could be kind of peaceful? Uh, yeah, I, can, I, I can't play songs or anything, but I can just play notes, I guess. Um, yeah, well, I'll do that. convincing to my amateur ear. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, it's a, it's a A minor, but a harmonic minor versus a natural minor. And I, I have no theory at all, but you can just tell the scale is completely different, or, or a few things are altered. And, yeah, and you can just hear it. Um, so yeah, I'll play a bit, and then we'll be done. <laughs> um, maybe. <laughs> well, I'm out of beer. I think it must be oh. near the end. <laughs> beer, please. <laughs> the sounds of the same. It's a tiny instrument, you can carry it with you traveling, but you can do, you know, you can just do single notes or even you just block one of the notes and you get more of a chord kind of thing. And then you can even the way you, you know, you can get more of a towel blizzard. Just the way you hold your lips and, and uh, to me this is the best instrument in the world. It's so nice. Like um, you know, music and and talk, uh, like like talk, some sort of talking blues <laughs> song. Uh, but I, 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 you've been you've been verbally picking on poets since the beginning <laughs> yeah. of our conversation. But you, <laughs> it turns poems. out you do have a soft spot for poetry, maybe even the poetry collection. But I suppose there's no way I can get you to re read us a poem of yours. I don't I don't have one handy. <laughs> I no, I didn't, I didn't bring any with me. Yeah, it's my yeah, fault I too. I don't have so any memorized. I know some writers who they do this and they speak their poems and they don't have to read it. But I, I, I mean, I can read this a million times and I still I have to have the copy in front of me. I still do that. But do you, do you like change, change things from reading to reading? If you have the same copy, for instance, uh, when you... When you you know pref come to the reading, take out your copy. Yeah. Do you have some interventions on the place, maybe? Um, or yeah, just, just yeah. I mean, some of these markings are probably from reading it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a reading series in Fredericton. It's actually usually poets, but uh, I've often read something new there that I'd never read before, and so I found it really helpful. So yeah, there's times I do mark it up. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, like, to have